uh, uh, interesting and important question for for people to understand. Okay, now uh, the way we have been doing testing, or at least in organizations, the way it is expected that we do testing, is uh, you know, in my opinion, uh, slightly different from the way I look at it. Okay, a lot of testers. The focus is generally on uh, you know writing test cases, uh, you know finding defects, and uh, uh, you know that's it. That's where it stops. In fact, uh, I would only say that you know it is just a part of the whole testing uh, process or testing journey. Okay, testing is not limited to writing a few test cases or marking them pass or fail. It is just a part of it. When you talk about testing, it begins. When the you know product journey begins at the time of user needs generation and requirements gathering, that is when the tester's journey begins with the product. Testing begins right then. Okay, testing is about conducting experiments, evaluating the product, learning more about the product. Okay, and in doing so, applying your analytical skills to identify and analyze risks. Think critically about the product. Think holistically about the product. Okay. Look for unknowns. And in the whole process, you will obviously find that, uh, you know, there are some defects. Mm -hmm. So defects are the byproduct of, of what you do. They should not be the goal. A lot of us think, oh, we will find some defects and then we are done as testers. No, that's not where you have to stop. It is much more than that. You have to collaborate with developers, you have to collaborate with business, you have to collaborate with stakeholders, you have to collaborate with, uh, you know, customers. And, and, and uh, you know, the way we are taught testing, uh, you know, we, we are limited to a certain process. We said, okay, no, this is, so you take the requirements, you turn them into test cases, you execute them, you uh, prepare a report, and then your testing is done. No, that's, that's, that's just a part of it, okay? And, and that, that is where the problem lies. Testers are seen as somebody who are just doing this job of finding defects. Now that, that has to change. That perspective needs to change. People need to understand testing is a much deeper thing than what they perceive it to be. Okay, And that is where I feel the testing community uh, has to play an important part. Uh, we as testers ourselves need to understand what value we bring in. It is always about the value, okay? Not about uh, you know just doing a few things like okay, writing test cases, finding defects. So yeah, I mean, I hope that answers the question. Yeah, it does. Um, also, if you have questions, um, you can drop. I mean, like um, in middle of the uh, session, you can ask them in the Q and A. Um, also, uh, Bridges, the next question is like, how do we? Uh, so we know. Um, we start with Selenium and uh, we know uh, the basics of testing and how do we prepare ourselves for an interview? Like we see the job description and it, uh, we see that it uh, demands more uh, than we already um, know or uh, already aware of. So how do we take this opportunity and uh, uh, like if the job description is not a fit for us, but still we feel confident that we can try, then how do we, uh, how do we give it a start? Like how can we, um, uh, um, uh, or what testing skills should we have and like uh, how confident can we be uh, to apply in the job? Okay, uh, so uh, this is a very interesting question now that you bring in a uh, job descriptions. Okay, so mm -hmm. um, job descriptions in the testing world, uh, especially in the testing world, have uh, been turning into uh, something that we don't want to see. Okay, they have been going in the negative direction is what I would say because if we look at the job descriptions of late uh, something that we find missing is uh, you know the basic testing skills they are no longer uh, mentioned in the job descriptions today today if you look at a typical job description it talks about tools it talks about coding okay you are no longer talking about testing you're no longer talking about the craft Okay, so in my opinion, in my personal opinion, it is always a good idea as a tester to focus on the basics, get the basics right. 
Okay. On top of that, if the job description demands you to uh, be aware of a certain coding language or of certain tools, yes, that should be there. But a precursor to, to any coding language or any uh, tools knowledge is the basic testing craft. If, without test craftsmanship, you are not going far. Okay, there is a basic difference between uh, you know just knowing tools or just knowing how to code and and being actually be able to apply your testing knowledge and think critically and then use those tools to support you in testing. So for me, for preparing for an interview, you have to start with the basics. Get the basics right. Then focus your energy on learning a coding language or a tool. Okay, again, uh, while we are at this subject, let me just tell you something. Okay, there are a lot of instances where I have seen that uh, a lot of testers are not interested in going in the direction of automation or tools or coding. And, and they find themselves stuck. Okay, and that is when they ask, okay, what do we do? Now, if you understand your product well, if you understand your domain well, if you understand uh, what problems you are trying to solve and what problems the solution is actually solving, if you understand all of that, then you can obviously go ahead and become a subject matter expert in that area. Okay, you should be the go-to guy when somebody has to talk about the product or the domain. Focus your energy in that direction. Don't be baffled by the fact that, okay, somebody is asking you to learn coding or uh, learn tools or something like that. Again, I'm saying this uh, very carefully because, you know, a lot of people will say, no, the job descriptions always demand automation. What do we do? Mm -hmm. Yes, learning automation is, is a good thing. Okay, it helps you. It will help you as a tester in making you more efficient, more productive. So automation will always complement the test craftsmanship. It will never replace it. Let us understand that. And if you find it difficult or if you find it uncomfortable to get in the, or go in the direction of automation, don't be threatened by it. Okay, get better at testing. Get better at the domain. Increase your knowledge. Let's talk to people. Okay, there are ways. It is not the end of the world. That is my sincere advice to a lot of people who, who prepare for interviews, who start talking about interviews and stuff. Okay, just like Adebio was uh, saying the other day, that testers need to be client savvy. Uh, yep. Yeah, so uh, it's like we need to uh, like think like a tester and uh, represent, the, uh, sorry, represent the customers. Uh, see, Lavanya, the thing is, uh, you know, uh, the days of customer satisfaction are gone. Mm -hmm. Now it's about customer success. Mm -hmm. So you, ha you have to understand from a business perspective, what is it that is going to make the customer successful? Okay, what is it that will add value to the project, to the product? Okay, how as a tester can I bring in that value? Mm -hmm. You have to understand things from a business perspective. You have to understand why the solution is there in place. What problem are you trying to solve? And once you get into that, you will find your life a lot more easier rather than worrying about, uh, you know, uh, knowing coding or not knowing coding. If you focus your energy in that direction, if you are able to contribute in a very meaningful way in discussions, if you are able to bring up ideas to the product owner, I will give you an example for that. So, uh, some time ago, I was working on a project where uh, they were developing an app for the elderly so that they could use it at the time of, you know, some emergency or something like that. Okay. And the interface was, uh, the UI was a uh, little bluish in color in line okay. with the company's logo and, and the design. Okay. So, you know, after going through all that and after understanding that this app is going to be for the elderly, uh, there was a suggestion that was made to the PO. And he said, okay, because it is going to be uh, used by the elderly, why not give it a greenish color? Because green is the color that suits the eye. Mm -hmm. And it will make, uh, you know, the elderly, they are looking at, you know, 
accepted in the meeting. It was discussed with the product owner because there was a justification to it. And uh, within no time, the company's logo was revamped. Mm -hmm. Everything was revamped. And, and uh, this color of the app was turned into green. So that is how you can actually bring in value. And this suggestion of, of, of transition from blue to green was done by a tester. Nice. Yeah, so, so likewise, you know. Yeah, the tester needs to go an extra mile. Yeah. And um, um, so, uh, Prithish, uh, now, uh, do we have uh, teams spending, ready to spend on testing? Like, um, so uh, even uh, studies say that we need to spend 25% on development, 25% uh, on testing. But still, uh, are teams now ready to spend on testing? Like, what, what do you think? Um, uh, I mean, like, this, is a very, this is a very interesting question, okay, because... Uh, what we see in a lot of organizations, uh, we've heard stories of teams trying to do away with testing teams and tester and things like that. Okay, let me uh, be very honest. Testing is not going anywhere. So if somebody is thinking that, okay, by using automation or by using, uh, uh, you know, AI or machine learning, you're going to replace testing, that's... Uh, that's a far-fetched dream. Mm -hmm. let, let me put it that way. Yeah. So it is important that the teams invest in testing. It is important that the teams encourage more and more testing to be done. It is important that you know if testers require some sort of support in terms of training in the product or you know uh, understanding the product a little more or getting better at testing in sort of in terms of you know uh, learning to code or or learning certain tools. And they need to be supported. Organizations need to look at that direction. Mm -hmm. This testing is not going anywhere. So investment, yes, uh, uh, it is a little bit on the decline, but it should people should wake up mm -hmm. to the fact that yeah, testing is needed, and you need to invest. Yeah. So um, uh, we would also run a poll on that uh, just to understand uh, how um, you know how your team um, is ready to spend on testing. Um, but before that, um, um, Brijesh, we also wanted to uh, understand, like, uh, uh, now that we are working from home, we also uh, ran a poll uh, a while back on uh, how productive uh, we feel um, now than before. And uh, almost all said it's hectic now um, <laughs> because it's uh, double the effort uh, that we need to put in. Uh, just like uh, Shefali was saying on the other day in Test to Speak, uh, I felt the same. So how, uh, how is it for you? How productive are you? Uh, well, uh, see, um, uh, location ha of, of work has never mattered to me because I am a consultant. I am, you know, uh, traveling a lot of times mm -hmm. and, you know, at the customer's location in my office or at home. Uh, it, it, it doesn't really make a difference. Okay. The, the thing is, of course, when you are in office or, or at the customer location, you are able to access them, uh, access the customer more easily. You know, you can just walk up. If you have a question, you can just walk up to the desk of a person that you need to talk to and, you know, get your questions answered. While if you are at home, then you need to rely on uh, emails and collaborative software and, and, and make sure that, okay, they are available and things like that. That is there. Okay. So for me, uh, personally, yeah, productivity wise, I don't see a drop. It is uh, hectic because, you know, we tend to work more when we are working from home. We, we log in early and log out late. That is a norm. But then if you set a calendar for yourself, if you say that, okay, I'm going to work stipulated eight hours and nine hours in the day and uh, you know, make sure that I give adequate time to my family and to myself, mm -hmm. then I think you should be able to do justice. Okay, the problem is we get so carried away in, in terms of working. We log in when we, uh, you know, normally start our journey for going to office in the morning. If, for example, if it's 7 a.m., uh, you leave your house to get to the office by, say, 8.30, 9 o'clock or whatever. Okay, so you log in at 7 a.m. And then you, in your mind, you say, okay, I usually get home by, by 7 p.m. So you do a 7 a.m. to a 7 p.m., which is 12 hours. Instead of that, if you say okay, that, okay, I start working, I start actually working at 8.30, so you log in at 8.30, and then you say, I stop all my work at, say, for example, uh, you know, uh, 
five thirty in the evening, completing nine hours of work. So you work till five thirty. Mm-hmm. Stop right there, rather than making it hectic for yourself. Always remember that uh, you know you have to give time to yourself, to your family, mm-hmm. because ultimately that is the most important thing. That is why you are working, right? Yeah. It, it, I mean, I I always tell people that that you know we work to live. We don't live to work. Mm-hmm. Right, so so we have to get that balance right. Okay. I know that okay in the flow when we when we are in the zone we tend to do a lot more. We mm-hmm. sort of you know uh, say okay let's finish this and uh, why to leave it till tomorrow? Let's let me do it today. No, if it can be done tomorrow, do it tomorrow. Give yourself the time. Give your family the time that they need. That would be my suggestion. Right, and. Uh... Uh, we have some questions in the Q and A, uh, Prajesh. We'll take them also. Yeah. Um, so there's a question um, uh, from Surendra. Uh, why are you a tester, and uh, what keeps you motivated to be a tester and continue the journey? Why am I a tester? Um, and what keeps you motivated? Well, uh, okay, uh, I am a tester because I, I like to uh, criticize products. <laughs> oh, that's. And, and 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 it is the only profession that uh, uh, probably pays you for criticizing stuff. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Uh, uh, so on a more serious note, I uh, you know got into testing the way I I, I share my journey, and then uh, uh, what keeps me going is the fact that okay, I am making a difference. in the product and through the product in the life of people i have had conversations with customers where they have seen where they have told me that you know the product that was uh, recently released i started using it it is so cool they know that there are bugs in it okay there is not one product which is 100% uh, defect free but then the satisfaction to hear that something is working for a customer and the fact that you've tested it that keeps you going all the time so once you know that your product is in deployment it is you know customers have started using it and you've tested it you feel proud and that pride is what is something that the testers need to have testers need to be proud of the work that they are doing they are making software better thereby they are making people's lives better and that is something that that i always keep telling myself that you know in a way i am making people's lives better by making sure that the software that i uh, work on or i test is is getting better day by day and yeah so that's that's uh, the reason you know i test and i do it all the time I, i even in my free time if i have nothing to do i just open my phone and you know go through apps and find something to test mm-hmm. so yeah that's about me and uh Uh, Jayesh also has something uh, in the same line. Like, how can you convince someone to choose a test, choose testing as a career? Uh, okay. How can you convince someone? So that person. Oh, okay. uh, Anyone? Yeah. Yeah. So, so first of all, is um, convincing somebody. Uh, I look at it from two perspectives. Okay. What is your objective in trying to convince somebody? Is the other person coming to you for suggestion and saying okay if i have an option of you know becoming a developer or a tester what will you suggest okay so based on your experience as a tester you might make a suggestion or you know get into testing but then you have to convince you have to convince yourself first so for me it is more about convincing yourself if you are convinced as a tester you will be able to convince anybody else okay so are you convinced in your jobs that you are doing the right thing that you are in the right profession that you are you know uh, serving the community you're serving uh, the world at large okay that is that that is one thing now secondly if you have to convince somebody else then you tell them the value you talk about the value that they bring in by by testing by making things you know better uh basically you talk about things like you know the career perspective mm-hmm. testing is not going anywhere like i said okay you may see a decline happening in say the manufacturing industry or or uh, whatever but as long as people are there now 
they are developing software for almost everything you will need testing right so that's, that that testing as a career is not going anywhere so it is a very safe uh, profession in my opinion okay others may have a different take on this but i believe that it is one of the safest professions to be in yes of course companies have their own things uh, a lot of companies fire testers first because they do not understand testing that well of course that is there but if, from a long term perspective testing is something that will exist for a long time so mm-hmm. if you are not testing um, uh, uh, software in, in on your phone you can test software on on the computer or or you can you, you can test some other software so that will always be there options will always be available secondly uh, you have to believe from inside that by doing what you are doing you are actually helping a lot of people mm-hmm. because when you start testing you if you are focused only on say bugs or passing or failing a few test cases then like i said it does not do the job for you you have to believe that you are bringing in value in terms of uh, you know helping uh, identifying issues in the product of making observations giving the right kind of information to the stakeholders so that they can take the right decision about the product once you understand that then i think you are doing justice to your your role you cannot just stop at finding bugs and that is the sad truth that a lot of people believe that testing is just about finding bugs and that there is no future in it mm-hmm. right um also uh, the next question uh, i hope that i answered your question uh, uh, jayesh so uh, if if there is um, yeah yes that answers it so um, yeah lavan thank you thank you okay so um uh, this is this other question that we have is uh in yours how is the career uh, ahead <laughs> well uh, it is probably the questions of of uh, a question of the day okay question now i'll tell you what has happened uh, during the evolution of uh, of testing over the years when i uh, joined it was you know we used to follow uh, normal uh, sdlc as they call it and you know the waterfall model and uh, people saw that okay there was a natural progression in in uh, testing so you join as a test engineer you become a senior test engineer then you become a lead Uh, maybe a senior lead and then they become a test manager and uh, the people there was an assumption in the minds of the people that uh, if you are a test manager you, your workload sort of decreases and uh, you can have control on things and unfortunately that is a perception that has been built over the years that managers uh, control things and they don't do anything or things okay so so because of this people saw this career path as as a very lucrative one now after some time people started realizing the value of having a center of excellence so all companies they started building center of excellence and that gave the confidence to the testers that okay we have a centralized body that is controlling all the testing because you know they believed that it is all about an independent verification and validation and and testing should be independent their say uh, their opinion matters they can stop releases uh, from going to the product uh, people will always ask them well to be very honest people had a very shallow understanding of testing at that point of time again it was only limited to uh, you know being able to find bugs and say okay we i have found a show stopper stop the release so it was something about control and and people always wanted to have that control and that is where the problem was so this whole thing was happening and uh, suddenly agile came and the moment agile came in and people started talking about testing being a part of development team and they have to work together and that there is no concept of a test lead there is no concept of a test manager in the team 
uh, you know, constantly this, these things, and so people got threatened. And suddenly, you started seeing that the COE started disappearing. Okay, a lot of center of excellences were decommissioned. Uh, people were clueless. People at the experience level of you know 10 plus years, 15 plus years, where they would have easily become a manager, uh, a senior manager. Suddenly, they found themselves out of place. They said, "Oh, I do not foresee a career uh, anymore." I don't know how am I going to grow. Okay, that challenge was always there. Now, okay, now we are seeing DevOps and, and, and the situation still remains the same. Okay. I am always in favor of having a COE for testing. Okay. Whether you are working in a decentralized uh, manner, like for example, we do in Agile where every team has its own, you know, individual tester and uh, you know testing happens within within the project but i i see the role of a coe i see the coe as a support body which can support the tester in terms of knowledge in, in terms of you know uh, any tools that is required the coe can keep doing all the research side by side and whenever there is a question that is raised by a particular team they can support they can say okay you need this this uh, uh, tools training, we will provide you. We will help you with that. We will guide you along. Okay, any project which is having a shortfall of resources can go back to the COE and the COE can actually supply people and say, okay, you know what? You can get two more testers, do your stuff and then the testers come back or something. So so a lot of things can happen in that direction. So that that's where I see that a COE is still needed, which means that the natural progression of testers can still continue in terms of you know, becoming a lead, becoming a manager and things like that. But companies have to constructively think that way. But of course, you know, there are there are financial challenges and stuff like that. But then this is one of the ways. The other thing, okay, as a tester, how do you progress? You can still become a specialist in whatever you are doing. If you are, uh, say for example, uh, just doing UI testing, you can become a UI testing specialist. If you are a performance tester, you can become a performance test specialist. You can become somebody who knows everything about performance testing. You can become somebody who knows everything about uh, security testing, thereby becoming an expert. So from being a specialist to becoming an expert, there is a career progression. And then you can go on to become a test coach. You can coach teams, you can become a consultant. Okay, you can help teams understand the value of uh, of testing, help them grow. Okay, help projects and saying, okay, you need help with uh, you know formalizing a test strategy. I'm here. I'm the consultant. I can help you do that. So there is definitely a career progression, a career path. So for testers, they don't have to get baffled at no, oh, it is the end of the world. You you will of course miss that manager tag. Uh, which means that you will not have that control, that power that you're probably looking for. But is that power important or is the satisfaction at the end of the day important? Is a question that I'll always ask. I'm sorry, this was a little long answer, but uh, but that's uh, uh, you know something that I wanted to share. Sure. Uh, do you have a follow-up question, Anu? Actually, okay. I have asked this question. Yeah, sure. Uh, so I have a follow up question, like sometimes situation also not matters to give you a test lead tag, like, so I'm working with a startup, uh, a product type startup. So I'm working with the startup for three years. There are already two test leads. There is one in pipeline if there are two leaves. So if I have to look for a test lead outside this company, they already require the experience of a test lead for two years. So how can in this situation, we can proceed for this? See, uh, as long as you have uh, a designation as the goal, I don't think you are uh, going too far. Okay, I know that society demands for uh, designations. Society cares about designations. Uh, you know, we tie uh, respect to certain designations. But if you are chasing designations, uh, you are not going too far in your career. I will be very honest about it. So my suggestion is to stop chasing that test lead goal. Focus your, your energy in understanding the business better. If you are able to make good suggestions, okay, if you are able to bring in value as a tester by 
by finding a lot of unknowns in the application that you're testing, by making sure that you give a lot of relevant information to the stakeholders, they will see value in you. And, and, and for all you know, you may uh, you know, get into a position which, which nobody will actually be thinking of as a test engineer. You know, you can become a domain expert, which is of great importance. And if you are, say, for example, a domain expert in, say, healthcare, or a domain expert in financial services, or in case of you know some of the domains that I work with, like material sciences, the demand is high. Okay, so do not. My suggestion is do not focus on that test lead, test manager designation. It doesn't help. Okay, they are designated. Yes. I understand. I understand that when you tell somebody that I'm a test lead or a test manager, people look at you with a certain level of respect. But if you are able to explain that, you know what, I am a domain expert. I am the champion of what I do. Once you start believing that, then I think that will give you the confidence. It will not matter as to who is saying what. Okay, if somebody is comparing and saying, oh, so and so is a manager in, in like 10 years time and, and you are just somebody who's testing it doesn't matter okay for me i take pride in calling myself a tester it doesn't matter if my role is of a of a test architect or a test manager roles can be different designations can be different it doesn't matter you should be happy in doing what you're doing you should take pride in doing what you're doing that is my simple answer to you thank you did i make sense i mean uh, yeah uh, of course, I think so. What you already explained, I am doing that only. I'm either pointing, pointing out very good mistakes and very new enhancements also. So I'm always good, appreciated good. for this, but I'm finding something which is missing. So that only a test lead can do. I think I'm not have a, that much power that I can implement new uh, things. No, see, if, if, if you think that uh, there is something a test lead can do and a tester cannot do, let me let me tell you. And in my 20 years of experience, I have never seen a situation where something can be done by a test manager and that cannot be done by a tester. A tester can do, okay, he may not have the authority to exercise and say that, okay, you have to do it this way. But as long as your suggestion makes sense, as long as your ideas make sense to the organization, they add value to the organization, they add value to the product, they add value to the project, then you are good. So, you know, you should think about things from that perspective. Yeah. It makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Awesome. I'm glad. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, the next question then. Um, also, British, can you make me a host so I can unmute a few uh, who are joined late? Um, I'm, I'm yeah. I, do I have the power to do that? Yes, you have. <laughs> Um, and uh, how do I do that? Do you see a more option? Mm. Oh, or it's fine. Uh, you can unmute them um, or they can just ping on chat. I just made you the post. Okay, thanks. I, okay. I was uh, not aware that I have so much power. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So uh, another question, um, British, it's a long one. Do you want to read it? Or do you want me to read or do you want to read it? Uh, I Please be my yeah. guest. Okay, yeah. okay, sure. So, um, automating scripts are one of the goals of a sprint. So, uh, the question is, when there is a delay in build from developer due to any reason in this situation, do we need to postpone scripting to the uh, next sprint or completely skip as of now uh, till we get time? Are we Then can we consider the sprint as complete? Okay. This is a very common challenge. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I always recommend in sprint automation. I always recommend that. If you are doing testing in a following sprint or something like that, you are uh, not doing justice. Okay. It is about meeting your definition of done. That is something that, that uh, you know, you always need to be aware of. Okay. So if you are meeting the definition of done then only you should be able to release that piece so if automating a certain uh, user story or writing the scripts and, and executing the scripts are a part of the definition of done 
then you should definitely do it within the sprint mm -hmm. okay for in order to achieve that what you need to be doing is you need to make sure that your stories are as granular as possible your Okay. Uh, your stories need to be uh, absolutely granular. The common mistake that uh, is happening is when people have, uh, you know, stories that are too big. Then uh, the size of of the corresponding tests that you are writing also increases. Thereby, the size of the script that uh, you need to do also increases and consequently it is a disaster okay mm -hmm. and because the stories are so big the development team also takes a lot of time so in the end testing gets only um, say one day in a sprint or, or or a few hours in a sprint to actually test it and it goes as untested and then you probably take a decision oh no we will do testing in the next week. that is never a good idea so, so for me to solve your problem, you know, the first thing that you should do is to make sure that the stories that you're taking up as a part of your sprint goal are as small as possible. Make sure that they are achievable. Okay, make sure that they are first of all testable and then secondly, make sure that they are achievable. If you cannot achieve that in the sprint, then don't, don't, don't go for it. Okay. Make them small enough, plan your capacity well and only take up the work. That is the only solution that I can give you. Okay. And now talking about developers delaying, that is also because of the fact that, that the story is too big. They take a lot of time in building the whole thing for you. So that is my answer. Does that help? Um, to, um... Uh, I think uh, that answers the question. Um, so uh, also this uh, the uh, sprint, the meetup, uh, the stand up meetings that we have, they get uh, every day when you get to do it. Isn't it a little bit exhausting uh, or no? Uh, well, OK, so how many people actually uh, this, this actually could be a poll question. Yeah, we can put okay, How many people understand why do we do stand? -up? It's a yes or no question. Okay. Uh, maybe you can run a poll and, yes. and we'll see the result. But, uh, but I will give you my understanding uh, before anybody answers. In my opinion, among when I talk about people that I have worked with, I can safely say that 80% of the population does not understand the objective of stand up meetings. Okay. A lot of people. A lot of people think that it is more of a status meeting to tell that, okay, what is uh, going on in the project? No, that is not the idea. You have to understand that you have identified after your sprint planning, a sprint goal that you will need to achieve at the end of two weeks or three weeks or whatever is the sprint duration that you're working on. Now, in that two weeks or three weeks duration, you have uh, 10 days or 15 days of actual working time which means that you have 15 days of tasks to be planned every day you do a stand up for 15 minutes to plan for that day stand up meeting is a planning meeting it is not a status meeting yes you do ask a question what what were you doing yesterday or what was i doing yesterday in order to be able to plan what are you going to do today it is not to give a status, so the objective needs to be understood. And that is where there is a lot of failure. And that is where it seems exhausting. It seems, oh, why are we doing this every day? You don't want to send a status out to the world every day. What you want to do is to plan for your tasks. And when you say, okay, yesterday I was doing A, today I will be doing B. But in order to do B, I have certain impediments. Okay, that is the main objective. And those impediments may include collaborating with fellow testers, may include collaborating with developers, may include collaborating with uh, business. 
may include collaborating uh, 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 you know uh, uh, a small chat with the product owner so if we do not understand this difference it is going to be cumbersome okay start up meetings uh, in a lot of places they stay 15 minutes but people are happy talking about it for an hour and then they say okay if we are doing meetings all day how much time do we have to do the actual work so so yeah i, I mean uh, on on the subject of stand up meetings i think we have to understand that it is not a serious meeting but a planning meeting for planning every day as long as you understand the objective i think that is all the problem okay so uh, we'll just launch a poll on that right and now don't uh, give the answer based on what i just said and yeah give the answer based on what is actually happening in your organization okay uh, so the majority is uh, that stand up meetings actually keeps us informed and not and 10% say they are exhausting with me and uh, 25% say that they are just status meetings only okay 35% basically uh, uh, say 25%. that they are just meetings yeah. and 65% say it keeps me informed it is not about keeping you informed as well that is also a wrong answer so this was probably a trick question okay it is about planning how many of you are actually planning saying okay you know what i need to do this today i need to be able to finish the testing of uh, you know module a b and c today okay so you are you planning for that task what do i need to do do i have the test environment ready do i have the the functionality ready do i have you know the scenarios written down somewhere where i can plan okay do i have enough information about what i am going to test today those are the questions that you should be asking yourself mm -hmm. okay and then think okay in order to achieve this task today these are the things that i need and out of these things if i do not have anything then i raise a flag in the stand up meeting saying this is my impediment i do not think the test environment is ready so how should i test because my goal for today is to test uh, you know abc and uh, abc functionality in order to test i need this environment which is not yet up that is an impediment that is how you arrive at it okay so so do not think of it from an information perspective do not treat it as exhausting do not treat it as a status meeting think of it as a planning meeting what you want to do on that particular day and you know uh, there's another thing uh, that i have noticed a lot of people keep stand up meeting as at any time of the day which is kind of absurd okay i it is always ideal and it is always my suggestion that you do the stand up at the start of the day okay so you begin your day by planning and then you carry through the task during the day you don't do a stand up meeting at at uh, you know 12 30 pm just before going to lunch because half of the day is already gone okay? mm -hmm. yeah so so if you want to bring in some more structure if you want to make your life easy If you are doing late stand-up meetings, make sure that you go and tell your uh, scrum master or, or whoever is in charge of the stand-up meetings to 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 shift the timing to morning nine o'clock or mm -hmm. or eight thirty or whatever is, is is your starting time. Right. Also, Nagesh has uh, a comment that many places uh, in many places the meeting starts once the manager reaches the office. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. No, a manager has no say in the stand-up meeting. You can do without without the manager. Right. <laughs> okay. So I'll just um, I'll publish the results. So seventy-one percent say um, it's beneficial, and twenty-five uh, saying that uh, they are just status meetings. But I think we can uh, think on it. Uh, we can go back and uh, fix this. I think there is a bug here. I don't know. The calculations don't add up. Because yeah, because seventy-one uh, percent plus thirty plus thirty-five. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. more than hundred percent. Yes. Well, okay, good. Yes. Uh, <laughs> yes. You you are odd to find mistakes. I understand. 
<laughs> yeah, sorry, I'm I'm tuned that way, so. Yeah. Okay, so uh, there is uh, another question that we'll take. Um, so, uh, can a tester become a product owner? Is that good to choose product owner career path, and how will be the opportunities for a product owner be in future? Why does a tester want to become a product owner? What's wrong in being a tester lifelong? Mm -hmm. That would be my counter question. Mm -hmm. What's wrong in being a tester lifelong? I know people who have been uh, testers for like 40 years, 50 years, and they are enjoying it so much. I do not know how many of the people here in this uh, you know, webinar have, have, have actually heard of people like you know, Jerry Weinberg, have heard of people like James Buck, Michael Bolton. They have been doing testing for like 40 years, 50 years. So, I mean, uh, it, it is a very strange question to me, to be very honest. Now, if, if somebody say, oh, no, I don't want to, uh, you know, I, I see that uh, product owners are, are a lot more respected and, and things like that. And, and the society looks at them in a big way. And I want to become a product owner. Well, yes, you can. But to become a product owner, you have to have solid understanding about the product. Do you know everything inside out about the product? Being a tester helps. It gives you the opportunity to know everything inside out about the product, about the domain, about the business. Once you have established all of that, probably you can think of it. Yes. But first I would ask, why do I want to leave such a noble profession as testing and, and want to do something else? I mean, I, I know that that may not be the answer that's, uh, that, that, that is being looked at, but that is my, my thing, you know. Uh, I'm a tester. I, I, I'm a really proud tester. I, I always say you should always be proud to be a tester. Don't let go of it. I mean, yes, product owner, good idea. But why is the question that I would ask. Okay. So um, another one is... Uh, from Sachin, what according to you is one, the topmost quality that should be there in a tester and how it is more important than other qualities? The one quality as a tester. Oh, well, Sachin has put me on spot like he always does. <laughs> uh, the one quality for me as a tester is to be true to yourself. Okay, when you are testing a product, are you true to yourself in talking about it to other people? Are you brushing things under the carpet? Mm -hmm. Are you saying, ah, this is okay, I may find a workaround, and probably that will work? Point is, you be true to yourself and be honest about getting your feedback out. Okay, you are there to provide information about the product about what it is doing about things it is not doing about things that are strange about the product to the people who matter and if you are not true to yourself you will never give them that information and if they do not get the right information your product will never improve so for me the quality that is needed is honesty you know are you true to yourself are you answering the question i mean if somebody comes to you and says, okay, well, you know what, this is the product and this is the information that you've collected. Will you be happy if only half that information is given and, and some, some part of it is skipped? No. Will you be happy if you are given the wrong information? No. So put yourself in that situation and think, okay, what do I need to do? I need to be honest. I need to be able to express myself you know in a very candid manner i want to be open i i don't want to be afraid of anybody and, and if you don't want to be afraid of anybody and if you want to express your opinion in the best possible way then you have to be true to yourself so that is the topmost quality that 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 i would think a tester should have awesome so uh, moving on to the next uh, question um, 
Hi, Pritesh. What is your take on sprint retrospectives? Uh, how can testers share feedback with other team members positively? Uh, I think they should always uh, share the feedback positively. The, I mean, I know that uh, sometimes you may carry some bad news, but bad news also can be given in a positive way. So about sprint, about sprint retrospectives, uh, it is a must attend. First of all, it is a must to do ceremony. Okay, you must always do it. You must always do it with an open mind. Go into the retrospective with an open mind. Okay, with first of all, have that quality that I just spoke about. Be true to yourself. Be willing to share everything the way it is. Okay, but then, in order to give the bad news, you may have to wrap it around uh, nicely and and convey it in a very diplomatic, very assertive way. Okay, saying that, you know, while you would have wanted it to work in a certain way, there is a different uh, way, uh, response that we are seeing from the system. Okay, so be diplomatic. Don't say, you know, uh, the developer made a mistake here, or I think that uh, you know, this thing has gone wrong. I mean, yes, you want to convey that information that there was a mistake, but don't get into that mode where you are trying to put the blame on somebody. Okay, because it is not nice if somebody else starts blaming you for something. So think about it. So go into the retrospective with an open mind. Go there, say things in a positive way by uh, putting it in a very assertive manner. Assertiveness is a good skill to have. If you think what is assertiveness, it is but it is a very thin line between being absolutely timid and being absolutely aggressive. You have to understand that there are other people in the meeting, that they have opinion that you need to respect while you convey your opinion. So, so you must constantly think about ways in which you can relay the feedback in a very positive manner. Right. And uh, Subbu says in a constructive way. Yes. That's right. And uh, uh, Shifali has a question um, that testers are not given credits for what they are doing. Uh, instead, they are being questioned when there are some issues in the production. What are your suggestions to the management or to the team on this? Why are testers blamed? That's true. Uh, testers are blamed because they do not speak enough at the right time, okay, in the right way. So, again, if you understand as a tester that there is an issue, you bring it up in a way that could be understood by the business as to why that is a problem. If you show them that, okay, there is a risk that you are running if, it, if a particular feature fails and that risk may cost you so much money, that is the language that, that, that management likes to talk about, right? So if you show them the, the, the monetary value because of that feature failing, then they will take notice. They will say, ah, this person is making sense. Right? And that's where you will see yourself adding value. So, when, so again, it boils down to a situation where you understand the product well enough. From a tester's perspective, always be open, always be vocal, but even uh, additional logic or additional support to your answers or to your proposition or to your feedback so that people understand it well enough. You know, if you speak to a tester as a tester, they will understand very well. If you speak to a tester as a manager, the testers will listen to some things and then they'll let things go. Similarly, if you're talking to management and if you are talking to them in the sense for business, okay, if you are telling them that, that you're presenting your, your report and saying, okay, I've got, uh, you know, 10 defects out of which three of them are, are showstoppers. And, and, and you explain to them how those three showstoppers can actually halt the business completely, then they will take notice. So it is about being able to present the information in a very constructive way. Now to the management, my suggestion is, uh, you know, stop overlooking testers. Stop blaming them for everything. If there is an issue, uh, for example, which is found in production, you don't blame the tester for it. Right. First question you ask is, how did this requirement come in? 
Okay, what was what happened when the requirement came in? Who were the parties who were involved in understanding this requirement? Was the tester involved in the very first place? If the answer to that question is no, then you have the problem right there. A lot of times I have seen in my experience that the testers get the information from the developer. Mm -hmm. That is the developer's version of the requirements come to the testers. I mean, how much sense does it make? So whatever you test, whatever test case you will write, it will always pass because it is the developer's version. You don't do that, right? What you need to do there is to make sure that the testers are involved early. They are right from the start of the project involved in a manner that they are, uh, you know, uh, understanding what the product is. They are able to look at it, analyze it, think about the risk, put the risk out and say, you know what, if this is not done right, then this is the problem that we are going to run into. And that's where testers will help you in bringing value. So instead of, instead of blaming them, you know, do some introspection. Look at the process that you have in place. If you think, uh, you know, that testers do not have, and, and, and I'm saying this based on, uh, you know, a lot of recent conversation that we've, we've had in our uh, test chat community and, and in speaking to a lot of testers, that a lot of testers do not have access to product owners, which is, which is very strange. You need a process fix right there. Why not? Why can't the testers speak to the product owner or if required to the customer? to understand the requirement better. What is going to happen? You see that as a breach of hierarchy. I see that as a big problem. The tester doesn't understand what needs to be tested. So how can you expect them to test properly? Why can't a defect be missed? Fix that problem first, instead of blaming the tester. That is my message to the management. If, if somebody from management is listening, okay, they need to understand the fact that testers are there to help you. They are not, they are there to save your reputation in the market. So blaming them doesn't help. Not involving them doesn't help. Okay, so if you are in the management, if you are listening, then this is my, my suggestion. And if you are a tester, okay, be very candid, but learn to be assertive. Assertiveness is a very good skill that a tester needs to learn. You express your opinion without hurting the other person's sentiments or emotions. Okay, don't, I mean, uh, I can go into a full or full on assertiveness class here, but I think that will take a lot of time. But this is a very important issue. I mean, thank you for the question, Shifali. Thank you for answering, Rajesh. I mean, yeah, you covered all the points that what message management needs to take and uh, what message testers need to take from it. So I guess you covered everything. Thank you. Awesome. So now we'll move on to the next question and it is from Ahilesh. He asks, what is a tester's career path like after 15 to 20 years of experience apart from management work? So um, I think we covered well, it. Yeah, I think I've already spoken about it. You can yeah. become a test consultant. You can become a test coach, okay, and uh, giving it back to the community uh, is something that testers need to do at, at that point of time. And, uh, you know, being a test coach or test consultant gives you ample opportunities of giving it back to the community. Right. So, uh, yeah, that is something that I would suggest. Okay. So, uh, Nagesh has a question. So, how can we bring the change in looking at testing top down or bottom up? Both ways. Testers have responsibility, the management has responsibility. Testers need to be vocal, they need to add value, they need to engage in, in meaningful conversations in the project. Okay, they need to learn to call a spade a spade. Like I previously said, be true to yourself. Have the confidence. Okay, I, I speak about this uh, as a you know, tester's progression. In the career, there are three things that I spoke to speak about always. Number one is self-confidence. Build that self-confidence. Okay, as a tester, be confident about what you're doing. Acquire the knowledge that will help you get to that level of confidence. Do some work. Okay, learn. Attend uh, meetups. Go into discussions with testers, with developers, with everybody. 
Okay, groom yourself. Then the second step is self-awareness. Be aware about the things that you know. Be aware about the things that you don't know. Acknowledge that you don't know certain things. It is okay to not know certain things. Once you are aware, then you can you will develop the willingness to work on it. And once you have the willingness to work on it, you will be uh, able to learn more, acquire more information, and and get better at it. And the third and the most important thing is self discovery. You will grow, and you at a point you will discover the fact that okay, there is a uh, you know something unique about you. There's something special about you. You are you have an inclination towards performance testing. You love performance testing, so you will focus your energy in doing that and become an expert there. So that is how you start at bottom up. Okay, you start your thing from top down perspective. The management also needs to start understanding that the testers, like I said previously to the uh, previous answer, that you know the testers are there to to help you build your reputation, keep it going. Testers are there to help you. Nobody is uh, you know uh, happy finding a bug and saying okay let the I found the bug and let me celebrate. No, that bug needs to be fixed. That bug needs to be addressed. If a developer thinks that okay. A tester has found a bug in my my code, and my ego is hurt because of that. Because I am an expert and I write great code. No, that's. I mean, come on. What are we talking about? So, the management also needs to look at it. The testers also need to look at it. So, to answer your question, Nagesh, it has has to happen in both directions. And at a point, at some point, you need to shake hands. Okay, so it's not a one-way traffic. Okay, um, so let's move on to the next one then. Um, it's from Aman. What approach we should follow while applying for any job? Like whether we should apply for a job even if we fulfill only few skills or if we possess all the skills mentioned. So we covered that too. Yeah, uh, one 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 very important thing that I want to talk about here is yeah. you know a lot of lot of people who are looking at jobs end up. Uh, applying for everything that they see don't do that by doing that you are limiting your chances of getting select okay another suggestion that i want to give is you know um, uh, all the job required all the job descriptions are unique they have uh, something different so you can't send the same cv everywhere do not have one version of cv uh, one generic one and then you send it everywhere you know we have this habit that we have uh, our CV put in job portal and we just say it apply based on the CV that is there. When you see a job requirement, fine tune your CV according to the job requirement. Okay, and then apply accordingly. Always have a different version of, of the CV for a different job. You, you can have one with all your skills listed, but not all of them will be required for a particular job. Some will need some special uh, attention in certain areas to so make sure that you know your the, the work that you have done highlights those things. For example, if you are applying for uh, the role of a you know a usability test expert, uh, okay, the requirement specifically is about usability test, and you have done usability testing in one of your projects. Highlight that, okay, so that when the CV is being looked at, people. Are quickly seeing that okay, so this guy has done a lot of usability tests. So he's an expert. He can give us the right advice. So your chances increase rather than saying okay, I've done usability, I've done scalability, I've done performance. I've, I mean, all of that. Those are, are, are of course your skills. You know about them, but they are not required at that particular job. So fine tune your CV. Don't don't lie. Don't put in uh, information which is not uh, relevant. Put in information that is relevant. Okay, give the true information, but highlight the keywords that that are required in the job. Okay, pay attention to that. And like I said before, for every job, have a different CV. Don't go with the same CV for every job because every job description is different. Every customer is trying to solve a different problem. Right. Okay. Aman, do you have a follow-up question? Just let us know um, on in the chat. 
Yeah, or maybe, sure. yeah. Sure, okay. Um, now, uh, an important question, to, uh, question, Pratish. So, um, uh, ma um, it's from Male. Uh, she, uh, he asked, like, uh, sometimes I find that many companies use Agile just for reporting uh, purposes and to show off in the market. How can we resolve this issue? Um, there is a lot of truth to this statement. Okay. Um, uh, recently, somewhere I was talking about, I, I in fact wrote a post about cognitive biases that exist in the industry. Okay, we are all uh, driven by certain biases. And one of them is uh, the most common bias that I see is bandwagon bias, which means that if some person is doing it, others also do it without actually understanding what it, what it is. And people want to stay updated. They think, ah, okay, Agile is so cool. How about adding that Agile to our profile? You know, if we say that we are also an Agile shop, it will bring us more customers. So a lot of companies do that. You are you're very right in your observation, Malay, that a lot of companies do that and that is something that doesn't need to be done. If the Agile way of working doesn't fit your scheme of things, don't go for it. If you think that, that the way your work culture is and you can achieve the best in uh, following a traditional approach to software development, do that. Okay, it is not that you just need to be agile because everybody else is doing it. If you think that, uh, you know, within agile uh, umbrella, you have, you know, Scrum, you have Kanban, you have Lean, you have HP, you have so many others. If you think that Scrum is something that is not meant for you, don't do Scrum. I mean, look deeper. That is, that is something that, that people need to understand. Every time you start talking about Agile, suddenly the conversation turns into a discussion on Scrum. Why? Because everybody seems to be following the other person and doing it. They hear good things about a particular business. Things may have worked well for a particular business. How do you know that the same results will apply to your situation? Your context is different. You're trying to solve a different problem. Your customer is different. Your work culture is different. Consider all those facts and only then decide on the work methodology. And, and as testers, it is important. If you understand this, if you understand the cultural differences, if you understand the uniqueness of your business, point it out, bring it up. Okay, discuss this with your management. That you know what, maybe Scrum is not meant for us. Maybe Kanban will help us. Maybe we need to, we, we are producing a lot of waste as a part of our process. Maybe we need to look at lean and eliminate all that waste. Okay, do that. Speak about it. So, you know, you can't uh, follow the same approach for every project. It is, it is not a wise thing to do. Okay. That's what I will say. Yeah. yeah. So, um, Prajesh, um, like how can agile teams work? This is a question from me. Uh, how can agile teams work efficiently from their homes? Like. Uh, how do we communicate better? Uh, yeah, okay. I think I, I think we're, as a precursor to uh, to this particular webinar, I think we had a brief discussion about yeah. it. Yeah. Um, so, you know, uh, when we were learn, when we are learning about agile, there is a lot of times we ask questions, okay, about distributed teams and how does agile work with distributed teams, and we have uh, you know plans to deal with it. We say, okay, we need to collaborate. We need to work in a time zone uh, where there is maximum overlap between teams. And we make a lot of considerations. And uh, in uh, towards the end of January, the COVID situation happened. And what happened as a result was everybody, whether you like it or not, went into a distributed mode. Okay, so that became a problem in terms of uh, you know managing work. Yes, initially people were happy that okay, I'm getting a chance to work from home. But over a period of time, that became uh, very difficult. Uh, physically, from the perspective of you know how to stay connected and uh, how to how do I make sure that uh, you know I'm able to access the things that I need to when I'm working on a certain piece. Uh, how do I access my test environment? How do I access my test data and, and things like that? Then. From a mental perspective also, you are not seeing your colleagues on a daily basis. 
So how do I stay connected and all of those problems happen. Then again, if everybody is distributed, how, how as a team do you work together because you're not seeing each other anymore. So in order to be effective, that's where the collaboration tools like Teams and, and Slack and uh, you know, your Zoom and everything comes in handy. Okay, a lot of teams, what I've seen is uh, they've gone on to a full-on video call mode. So if you need some help, you get on a video call. Don't, don't just pick up the phone and, and call that person. Not on audio. Video because that gives you a right perspective. You get to see that person. And then you feel a lot more comfortable in talking about it. I know that a lot of companies still have a restriction uh, saying, oh no, video will uh, you know, cause problems. But that applies to a situation when they're working from the office environment. So from home, who's stopping you to do that? Right? So you get into a more collaborative uh, mode. It, a real distributed situation demands you to be more collaborative, demands you to use tools that are meant for that purpose. You have to make sure that, that you know you are talking to people that you need to. I have also seen in my experience that a team, you know, has an open meeting set throughout the day. So throughout the day, people are in the, on that call. You know, they are working together. They are talking to each other when they are working. It's an ongoing call for, for eight hours. I know that a lot of teams do that. But sometimes, you know, you may be worried about the, the internet bandwidth that you're consuming and things like that. So it may not be such a practical situation. But I know that people have done it in order to make sure that they are connected. So there are various ways you can you can use these tools. You can collaborate. Uh, you should, in fact, collaborate with people. You should get into huddles every now and then. Have a you know a chat over lunch. Okay, uh, get into a call during lunch time. You know, do virtual coffees. Okay, I'm taking a break. Uh, is is somebody joining me? Take a break, get into a call, have coffee together, virtually. You know, uh, so there are various ways of getting there. Okay. And uh, what percent of Agile is actually executed or followed? Uh, we got a question from Sahil. What percentage of Agile is actually executed? Um, so if you look at the state of Agile report, uh, which comes out every year, the uh, claim that is made is almost 97% of the companies have started either uh, working on Agile or they are talking about Agile implementation. Now, how many companies actually implement it? Well, that is uh, something that I wouldn't want to guess. Reason being, uh, when I say Agile, everybody has their own interpretation of, of Agile. Agile, in my opinion, is probably one of the most abused terms in the industry today. People have their own perception. People have, uh, you know, things like, okay, uh, I have a situation here and uh, I think in order to do it in an agile way, I don't need to document stuff. I, nowhere does the agile manifesto talk about no documentation, but people will say, no, documentation was not required because we are agile. Yeah. So you see situations like that and that, is kind of funny because that is your interpretation of agile that is not actually agile right so uh, if, if i have to answer this question what percentage well i wouldn't want to guess it is very very less in my opinion although the report uh, uh, state of the agile state of the uh, uh, report claims that 96 or 97 percent of the companies have adopted or are in the process of adopting agile was working uh, the actual implementation of pure agile way of working is very less mm -hmm. yeah okay and uh, uh Bridgesh, another question um so it's from rishi so um now that uh, um uh, we are working in so she's working in a company for some years for two years and uh, a solo tester in the team so uh, for some lead who is not passionate about testing uh, and knows very little uh, about testing and how to, the importance of testing, uh, but has product knowledge, um, how uh, should we make the team work as a single team? Um, currently, it is not possible because uh, 
uh, because she wants to work under proper experienced per experienced person with testing knowledge. Well, see, uh, if you think that the person who's leading you uh, mm -hmm. has got good product knowledge, find a way of, of working with that person so that you can get that product knowledge to yourself. Okay, learn from that person. And I'm sure when you go with the attitude of learning from a person, nobody will deny. If you say, I want to understand, I want to learn from you. If you use such words, okay, you see that or that person doesn't understand this. You do, right? You are the tester. You can take control. Okay, that person may not have got the, uh, the, the acumen for testing, but if that person has product knowledge, try and acquire that knowledge. Work with that person. Try and learn. Okay, and, and when you start learning from a person, uh, I will tell you this, a lot of times what happens is when I am trying to you know, share some knowledge with, with, with a lot of testers, I end up learning myself a lot of things. Because then you will see the minds of the other person opening up and they will ask questions which will make you think and thereby you will learn. So when you are working with that person, when you are asking about the product, when you are sharing ideas, then if you say, you know what, I think I can test it this way. What do you think? Post a question like that and seek that person's opinion. And then that person will think, oh, probably I need to invest a little more time in learning about testing. And, and this works, okay, this works every single time because if you want to uh, work with somebody, make sure that you give enough importance to that person's knowledge. So if that person is a product expert, if that person has got a lot of domain knowledge, give importance to that fact. Try and learn from that person. And when you go with that learning attitude, nobody says no. Nobody. I, at least I am yet to come across a person who will say, that, no, I'm not ready to share my knowledge. They will instead think the other way around. Oh, I am getting to showcase my knowledge. I am getting to teach somebody something. So, so they will feel proud about it. And then they will tell you. So take advantage of that situation. And if it still doesn't work, if you still have, uh, you know, too much going on, if there is a friction, well, then move out, move out of that company. It's, it's a very simple thing. I mean, don't don't uh, force yourself into something that you are uncomfortable. Right. If there is a follow-up question, please ping on chat, or uh, you can ping um, me. I think that was a question from Dishi, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So um, let's take another question. Uh, so uh, Anu asks, what if an automation guy has a wide experience in multiple platforms? Uh, like uh, in three different organizations, this guy has worked on Java, Python, JavaScript one by one and not using any more. Now the guy is uh, using some tools where there is not much of coding. So what would be your advice for a job change for that guy? How to prepare and what all to be included in resume and so on? Okay, in resume include uh, all things that you know about. Yeah. Okay, and like I said, for preparing for job, not all uh, job descriptions are the same. So I, I think I have answered this question previously mm -hmm. uh, from a job preparation perspective. If you are expert in, if you have worked on Python, you have worked on Java, you have worked on JavaScript, include all the three in your CV. Okay, but find your area of strength and see, okay, are you comfortable more with Java? If you are comfortable more with Java, then you look at openings that, that uh, require Java. And if you look at the openings with Java, then you will find something which will strike. And then, you know, fine tune your CV, give importance to your Java experience. Don't leave out the other two, but give importance to your Java experience in your CV and then push it. Okay, then prepare accordingly. Okay, prepare for the interview accordingly. Brush your Java skills and, and, and things. So it is. You, if you have all the three skills, you're no longer using it. Uh, well, in, definitely include it in the CV. Look for jobs. Find your area of interest first. Of all. You've learned all three. All three have been beneficial. You have expertise, but which one is the one which you like the most? Find that out, and then take the next step. Does that answer the question? Sanu, if you have any question, please let us know. 
we'll move on to the next thing. Um, okay, so um, we all want to know about uh, the uh, your uh, uh, mantra of nothing called manual testing. What uh, also Surendra wants to know about it, and what appropriate terms can be used in this regard as per your understanding or experience? Um, okay, long answer alert. Yeah. Uh, uh, nothing called manual testing. I'll tell you how it uh, actually started. Okay, so uh, the hashtag nothing called manual testing was uh, something that I used on LinkedIn uh, in order to save space on a particular post. LinkedIn posts are limited to 1300 characters. So whatever you want to say, you have to say it in 1300 characters. And for me, that is a very, very difficult job. Okay, I need to do a lot of chopping and changing. Although I can write up that post in I mean, you don't need uh, more than five minutes to write 1300 characters. So I can write it up in five minutes, but to fine tune it, to make sure that it fits in that 1300 characters thing, it gives out the meaning. Uh, you have to do a lot of circus. And, uh, and this hashtag was a result of all that circus that I was doing because I was trying to save space. And I wanted to convey the fact that that you know, you cannot divide testing purely on the basis of how you execute the test. That is wrong. It goes against the reason why you are actually testing. It shows that you do not understand testing if you are dividing testing purely based on the way it is executed. I am sorry, you do not understand testing. If you say that something was done manually, then you say, okay, there was manual labor involved. In so if you are, say, for example, in the manufacturing industry or an industry where people have to lift stuff and, and they do it manually and there is a lot of manual labor involved, then it makes sense. But here in this context of software, how much sense does it make? A developer writes code. Okay, before you had, uh, you know, uh, these IDEs like Eclipse, okay, they used to write code on Notepad, save that as a, as a you know a dot Java file and then do Java C and all all that. So would you call the manual developers? No, there are managers who who take pen and paper into the meetings and they write down notes and then they use that in their management practices. Will you call the manual managers? No. Then why do you want to call testers who are not uh, using any code or any tools as manual testers because they are just executing the tests which do not involve any tool. Weird logic, right? If there are no manual developers, no manual managers, then, then how can manual uh, testers exist? Manual testing does not exist. It never existed. It, it does not exist now. It will never exist. But, you know, in the industry, we have seen that a lot of times there are tools that come in okay and people need to sell those tools and in order to sell those tools there are a lot of fancy terms and jargon that, and things that are brought out and uh, people go all out so when initially people started talking about making sure that there is a computer program which enables you to do things a little faster you know but do a, a repetitive tasks a little faster that is the time tools started coming into the market and they said, because the machine is, is, is executing those tests for you based on the input that the user has given. The user giving the input was ignored. The emphasis was on the machine executing. And because it was fast, so people said, oh, this is automation because the machine is doing it. And if a man was to do it, then they call it as manual. I don't get the logic. Okay. Just because machine is just executing it you are calling it automatic what about the user input somebody has had to tell the machine or teach the machine or, or or code into it so that the machine is able to do it right what about that effort you isn't that manual so it all started from there and over the last 30 years this has been there and 30 years is a long time it's it's more than a generation Okay, so over a, an entire generation, this, this thing of dividing testing into manual and automation has happened. And it is seen so much that people uh, talk about it every time. 
I have seen people saying, I will teach you manual testing concepts. And, and I ask them, what are manual testing concepts? Then they tell me, no, it is about test planning. It is about test strategy. It is about test, de test design. Then I said, no, these are testing principles, testing concepts. These are not manual testing concepts. And if you think that, that you know, a tester is uh, a manual tester because he does not use any tools, you are forgetting that you use your brain, the mother of all tools. Right? So in that context, every tester around the world is using tools. I mean, I, I remember uh, there was a post I read where, where Pradeep Sondar Rajan uh, called it brain, brain well testing. Is that the right term? Probably it is. You know, in a recent uh, chat session, Michael Bolton said something very beautiful and I liked it. He said, it is experiential testing where, where there is, you know, you're experiencing while you're testing it. There is human intervention. I mean, you can call it so many other things, but I would still not go down that path. My question is, if you want to give it certain names, if you think that, okay, names are so important, classification is so important, why don't you classify it based on the skills that a person has? For example, when you go to doctors, okay, there are surgeons who perform surgery by using their hands. Yes, of course, they use the, the forceps and the scalpel and, and things like that. But they use their hands. So do you call them manual doctors? No, you still call them doctors. But then how do you classify them? If there is somebody who is an expert in, in uh, you know, normal regular medicine, you call them a general physician. If you have somebody who is an expert in matters of the heart, you call them cardiologists. If you have somebody dealing with your brain, you call them neurologists and so on and so forth. Okay. So you can say heart specialists or brain specialists or whatever. Okay. Child specialist. Similarly, in testing, you have people who are experts in just doing functional tests, things of functional test specialists, people who are experts in doing UI testing, UI test specialists, UI test experts, you have usability experts, you have security experts, performance experts, you classify them on the skill. That is the alternative that, that is there. It, it just need not be you know, manual uh, and automation. I, mean, I I feel so strange while using these terms. Even automation, you know, uh, in my opinion, even that does not exist. To to uh, to be fair, okay. I should probably have started a hashtag called nothing called automation testing, and people would have you know come with their guns blazing at me. Right. Then what are we doing? Okay. The fact is, you are uh, you are not automating. <laughs> stuff you are yes you are uh, writing some code which the machine executes but then if you have to choose specializations okay you can have a selenium test specialist you can have somebody who is an expert in using a tool like squish i was discussing that in context with you know testing something that has got cute components with somebody you can have a squish specialist okay so likewise based on the skill that you have based on the primary skill that you have you can do that classification but doing a classification purely based on the way you, you execute your test into manual and automation is not right because manual testing term never existed. Similarly, automation testing term also never existed. Mm -hmm. People have, are made to believe that and now you see that in all job descriptions, you see that in organizations and this is because it has been there for, for almost 30 years, more than uh, you know, a generation. And that is what has made things very difficult. So nothing called manual testing, the hashtag is an attempt to change the mindset is to help people understand that, no, this is not the right thing that you're doing. And I'm glad that a lot of testers are already understanding that they have adopted that in the language that they use at work, otherwise in discussions. So I, I, I'm really happy with the way things are going with, with that. Okay. Awesome. So if you have any follow-up questions or nothing called manual testing, can ping us on chat. And also, uh, Brijesh, a very uh, common question. So what is the main cause of spreading uh, the threats in market uh, for testers to be replaced by AI <clears throat> or ML? 
that is not going to happen mm-hmm. okay at least not in the foreseeable future mm-hmm. because the level of maturity that ai or machine learning has is still very low okay and in my opinion uh, ai or machine learning is only as good as the data is so if, uh, if 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 you need to have a good ai system if you need to have a good ml system then you would obviously want to make sure that uh, your data is good enough which means that you need to test the data you need a tester right there right so uh, to say that it will replace is a far fetched statement i know that uh, there are articles there are blogs there are, there are companies who are promoting this i think um, this is just a perceived threat this is not a real threat okay people think but this will take a long time to happen you don't have to worry testing will still be required if you are building a, in uh, machine learning systems or ai systems there will be testing required to to test those systems right you will need testers to to make sure that the ai algorithm is all right okay people talk about you know the self healing algorithm and so on and i had a very interesting discussion with somebody there was a post that was written about a particular uh, self healing algorithm and i asked okay how does the system know that the data that has been given to it or or, or whatever it has learned is wrong and it needs to unlearn and relearn so they said no self healing will will tell but my question is how do you know if it's wrong is the system capable of thinking yet is the system capable of analyzing that okay it is it is wrong information so my behavior or my output will be wrong until the time machines are capable of thinking this whole idea is is kind of absurd to me okay when you talk about self healing again that is within your program you have done something which will you know correct certain mistakes that is happening but for it to for for somebody to call it self healing when it doesn't understand the fact that it needs to uh, you know unlearn something and relearn it is not self healing as yet okay which means that that there is a, a lot of work that still needs to be done and that is where i feel uh, you know uh, it is not right now in a situation to replace testing probably in 100 years time maybe okay. if if we live that long all right and uh, um, another question then um in most companies uh, so we discussed uh, that testing uh, is not given the um, importance that it deserves but then uh, how can a team start and how do we make how do we make sure we follow a, a right um, strategy in testing well um yes testing not being given given the right importance is uh, is a problem okay is uh, a big problem in certain situations and that is where i keep talking about bringing in the value that you need to bring in uh, in terms of what testers are capable of doing okay show things in a positive light so uh, then the risk okay businesses need to understand that there is a risk involved if something doesn't go right show them the business value of it if something doesn't go right how much will be the loss in terms of you know a particular dollar amount if you have to show if you say that okay if the product does not do what it is supposed to be doing then we may lose uh, you know 5 million dollars of revenue if you show show them then that will raise alarm bells and they say okay so tell us how to save that money then that's where you know the testers come in and they say okay we test it and if we make sure that that the risk is eliminated then uh, i think we are good okay so so it is all about showing your value like i have been saying right from the beginning if you are able to do that then you are able to uh, you know convey the right information in the right way to the right people so the information has to be right number one number two it has to be conveyed in the right way and number three is it needs to be conveyed to the right people so that they can take the right decision so that is the way you know small teams can start working they have to understand the 
they have to first of all understand testing and secondly understand the value that they are adding as customer. For me, it is all about the value. When we buy a product, we don't buy the product just for itself. We buy it because of the value it brings us, brings in. Right? If, if, see, for example, if I were to buy a TV, okay, a, a 32 inch TV serves as much purpose as a 65 inch TV. But why would, why would I buy a 65 inch TV instead of a 32 inch TV? Because it adds certain value. Because it makes me feel as if I'm sitting in a, in a theater inside my house. Okay, because it, it changes the ambience around my house. You know, my, 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 uh, my son is happy because he's able to interact more. If the TV was smaller, maybe he would not have interacted as much. Because he does not like interacting with, the same, if, if, I, if the same video is playing on TV versus the same video playing on, on phone, he, he keeps the phone aside and he enjoys more with the TV. So that is the value. Right? And that is why I would prefer a 65 inch TV and not, not a small TV. Similarly, for all products, when, when our product goes out to the customer, he is looking at the value. Okay, yes. Does it solve the problem? Does it help me in making sure that my customers are happy? Is the question that the customer will ask you. So, think about it from that perspective. As a tester, you have to look beyond just defects or just a certain number of, of test cases. That's, that's, that's my message. Okay. And uh, Bridget, another question on Agile. Like, uh, when do we say a team has perfected Agile? Like, uh, what is the metrics for Agile success, we can say? Uh, uh, perfected Agile. Well, I'm yet to see a perfect Agile team. <laughs> okay. uh, it, it, it is a... Um, uh, let me put it this way. Uh, if you are trying to um, to make sure that your uh, uh, agile is kind of or, or the, uh, the agile adoption that you have done is perfect, then you have to first look at uh, the customer as a as a response mechanism. You measure it in terms of customer success. Does it bring in value in terms of customer success? Is the customer happy? with what you have done. Okay. Now, Agile, of course, the, the benefits of Agile is that you have a faster time to market. You have, uh, you know, you are involving the customer at each stage. You are showing him a potential suitable product. At each stage, you are able to make sure that the quality of the product is, 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 is high. So, all these benefits, if the customer actually realizes all three, then you would say that, yes, uh, your agile implementation is is successful. If if it is not meeting this goal, if your customer is not happy, then your agile is is not working out. You may have to look at it and uh, inspect and adapt and uh, make sure that you are doing the right things. I mean, use the customer. Okay, use customer success as as the metric for your success in agile. I can say okay, uh, we have numerous sprint metrics and, and, and things like that, uh, you know, burn downs and everything that we do to measure the health of our agile projects. But the real indicator for me is the happiness of the customer. Okay, that is what that I will look at. And uh, as far as uh, doing perfect agile, uh, like I said, I'm yet to meet a team which, which does agile, agile perfectly. People have their own adoptions, people have their own you know, things. Um, you know, I am a purist. I like to go it, go with it from uh, with an approach which is by the book. Okay, so if I see something deviating, uh, I get a little flustered. But then uh, that's that, that's my own personal thing. So so I you know get a little finicky about people doing things their way. But I also understand that there may be situations where uh, because of the organization's restrictions, because of the culture that is there things may not be uh, possible to adopt it in, a, it in a pure form. Now, of course, cultural change is something that, that is very important to, to bring in. And that is why if you have to adopt Agile, then you do it bottom, sorry, top down rather than bottom. In a lot of companies, Agile projects fail because of the way they are adopted. 
Certain teams will start by adopting as well. The management has no clue what is going on. So instead of that, let the management first have an understanding of, of why agile and what are the objectives and things like that, and then go ahead rather than going in the opposite direction. Right. So yeah, I mean, from a metrics, uh, measure the customer success. Awesome. Um, uh, Bridget, I think uh, we've uh, uh, covered uh, most of the questions, not all. We have a lot of questions pending, but uh, we'll try and cover uh, them in a blog, um, especially yeah. this um, on uh, agile uh, metrics, how we can uh, uh, target, the, how we can measure the success of agile. Sure. Um, also, uh, Brijesh, uh, before winding up, like, can you uh, please tell us about Test Chat, Tester Speak, your plans, and how can we be a part? Yeah. Of that? Okay. So, um, uh, uh, so one of the problems that I encountered, uh, you know, as a tester, and then in talking to the community, I, is I found that testers have always missed a platform to express themselves. Okay. Testers uh, have issues. The management sometimes doesn't want to listen. Uh, you you don't get heard so often. You don't get heard the way you want to. So, you know, I uh, wanted to have a platform where I could uh, help testers voice their opinion. Uh, the idea of Test Chat basically was influenced by Dr. Stephen Covey's book, The Eighth Habit. And the eighth habit basically is uh, talking about finding your voice and helping others find their voice. That is the mantra behind uh, starting Test Chat. Okay, and uh, Test Chat is basically a community where people come together. We are now, uh, you know, in the form of a WhatsApp group. We will, of course, probably be expanding into different uh, mode. Where we come and talk about testing, we come and talk about uh, things around testing, not just you know, test cases or, or test design or anything like that. We talk in general, we talk about the psychology, we, we talk about the philosophy behind testing, we talk about, we try and find, uh, you know, discussions about why things are happening in a particular way. Okay, we ask a lot of questions, we get a lot of responses, a lot of action keeps on happening. And if you look at uh, the chat, if you miss the chat for an hour, there are probably 150 to 160 messages that are waiting for you to be read okay so that is the kind of enthusiasm that people have in trying to express them so i wanted to take it to the next level i said okay now these voices are limited to a particular whatsapp group let me try and take it to the world and that's where the idea of uh, the youtube channel came by and and i'm ably supported by uh, you know by the group there are three more people who, who I work very closely with. And this idea was originally born when, when all four of us were actually talking. And, it, and that includes people like Sachin Sharma, who's there in the call. I, I uh, thought I saw Faiz, also Faiz Modi. And uh, there's another friend of mine from the UK, uh, Adebayo Jacob Zamu. So all four of us, we got together and we said, okay, we must have a platform. We must give it back to the community and we must do something. And that's how Test Chat was born. And then the idea of YouTube channel came along. And that's where we started uh, recording our calls and putting it there. The first episode somehow did not, could not get recorded because of technical limitations. The second episode got recorded. It is available on the YouTube channel. Then we started talking about Tester Speak series, where you know I interview testers for, for an hour uh, or so. And then, uh, you know, let them express their views and their opinions and that goes out to the world. Right. Okay. Uh, and uh, why one hour is because if I do it for five, 10 minutes, uh, you know, people may not be able to express themselves completely. I want to give people an opportunity to express themselves freely, openly. And I think one hour is a good enough time for people to do so. so that is what uh, it is. Now, currently, the plan is to make sure that everybody in the current group gets interviewed and, and has their opinion on test to speak which means that uh, you know, we have at least plans of 170 episodes uh, to be done. We will also be talking to testers uh, from outside the WhatsApp group because there are thousands of us in the industry. We want to hear their opinion. We 
will be talking to some of the experts in the industry or based on their availability if they can help us by sharing their journey their experiences so uh, that is all will all of that will feature we also are thinking of having different segments to make the channel a lot more interesting uh, we have a fun element to it with our instagram channel we uh, we are now on twitter as well uh, twitter is uh, the world of 280 characters as i call it is very interesting more of most of the testing experts that we speak about are on twitter so a lot of interaction a lot of action happens there so it is good for us to be there and uh, learn from them and then uh, you know of course uh, the youtube community is there we are uh, also going on facebook we will soon be on linkedin as well so yeah the the, the community is expanding the idea is to give a voice to the testers and uh, we are also coming up with a website which will have free resources for testers so we want to share the knowledge and the information for free okay to everybody we don't want to charge anybody we we think that uh, you know all the testers around the world should benefit from it and it should be all available for free so uh, that is the plan that we currently have i think i've uh, shared most of it there are certain uh, minute details but yeah uh, that you will see as a surprise nice awesome so uh, we can all uh, yeah there is the youtube link um, the email and also the twitter uh, details on chat you can yeah. uh, subscribe you can also subscribe us uh, uh, test sigma on linkedin and facebook also yes. on twitter um also um, if you have any uh, particular question any important um, thing that you want to uh, pass on to prajesh please um, take this time yeah i i wanted to uh, first of all also uh, you know uh, before anything before before closing i wanted to first of all uh, tell people that you know um, i don't know how many of you have actually heard about test sigma before uh, this ama but you must follow their work yeah. okay. i wanted to touch with them uh, because of uh, the conversation that that was happening on linkedin and uh, you know shruti and lavanya they got in touch with me and then we decided to do this Right. but they are uh, test sigma has been doing significant amount of work great amount of work for the community and they are uh, you know they have been doing webinars and they've been doing such amas i think there was uh, one which happened recently with people coach that was very interesting uh, you know and i see a lot of good stuff coming out of test sigma so that is one uh, good community one good team to be followed follow them on on twitter on linkedin uh, get in touch with these people there is a immense uh, knowledge base available so for all testers it will be quite handy if you get in touch with them and uh, i mean i must commend the great work that tesma has been doing and i want to thank uh, you for for giving me this opportunity to at least yeah. you know speak to the people and and help answer their questions thank you so much prajesh and thank you for the shout out and uh, so testigma is a testing tool if you want to check out any time it's a scriptless testing tool we use uh, nlp the tests are written in english um, so we say automate tests but since prajesh is here we say we just test them um, uh, so you can have a look at it it's in testigma.com yeah um now prajesh can we just take one question since i got this um, um, Sure. Personally, yeah. Sure. Um, so uh, there is this question that uh, uh, how what percent of testing can be automated and is regression smoke testing the only thing that can be automated efficiently? Huh? What percentage can be automated? Purely depends on the context. Okay. Uh, what uh, are you trying to automate? Are you trying to automate uh, at what layer? Okay. Uh, are you trying to automate at UI layer, are you trying to automate at API layer? Okay, so it it depends on the context. There is no fixed number. You must do a feasibility analysis before starting your uh, experimentation with automation, and that will give you some idea about what percentage can actually be automated. Uh, now coming to is regression smooth the only aspect that can be automated? Let me tell you this. Okay, we understand. Uh, automation very differently to be very honest uh, a lot of us uh, think that using tools is probably the only way we can automate 
we can automate a lot of things. We can, when we talk about automation, we, we ignore the fact that test data generation can be automated. We ignore the fact that test reporting can be automated. We ignore the fact that, that small things, okay, for example, I, I give this example because I, I worked a lot with a situation. I worked on a project where we had to re uh, reboot devices, you know, every two hours or something like that, and, and which involved rebooting of multiple hard drives and, and things like that. And that was a very redundant, time-consuming task for us to go and physically do it. So we wrote scripts. We would just trigger those scripts and those scripts will, will reboot the system and, and give us a green signal when the drive was up so that we could conduct the remaining tests. Okay, so such things okay, which, which aid your testing can also be automated. So when you talk about automation, it doesn't have to be limited to just the usage of tools. It doesn't have to be limited to just regression or smoke. If you can do small things, if you can um, you know, automate test data generation, because that is a big piece of the whole puzzle. If you can automate uh, configuration of your test environment, that is a big piece. Uh, if you can automate generation of your test report, that is a big piece. If you can automate analysis and visual representation uh, of, of, of results, that is a big piece. All of this, if you can put together, then all of this is automation. So it is not restricted just to, to regression, smooth, and sanity. It is much more. Okay, awesome. So um, I think uh, we'll take up all the questions. Uh, Bridget, we can have a blog for this. Uh, there are a lot of sure. questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you can pass on and, and I can um, you know type yeah. out the answers and then uh, you can share it. Yeah, sure. So everybody, um, um, we look forward to Tester Speak and Test Chat, Rajesh, and we are excited about the next um, uh, guests. Um, so do you want to tell who it, it will be? No. The next episode of Tester Speak releases tomorrow. Okay. Uh, who the guest is, is still a surprise. Okay. Okay. The community, uh, our group is also quite curious about it. So I want to uh, keep the surprise going. Okay. Last time also it was quite fun. So this is a mm -hmm. small fun thing that we do. Test chat community is basically a fun community. Okay, we laugh. We love to laugh together. Mm -hmm. okay, we have a lot of fun. You will. Uh, so yeah, I mean, we still have some room in the WhatsApp group. So yeah, uh, people are more than welcome to join. Mm -hmm. uh, ping me and uh, or or if you have access to the to the invite, which is there on LinkedIn, you can join through that. Okay and. Uh, you know, I, we look forward to having fun together as testers. Yes, amazing. Okay. Yes. So we'll all be a part. We'll try and be a part of it. Thank you yes. so much, well, Rajesh. We, uh, we really grilled you a lot. We uh, got so many answers from you. Thank you so thank much. Thank you so much for this opportunity. I think you guys are doing a great job. I think, uh, yes, people need to check out your tool. Uh, I think that is, that is a good uh, idea. Uh, mm -hmm. Apart from that, whatever events you're organizing, I think that is great for the community. You are already giving it back to the community in, in the best way possible. So keep that going. And I definitely look forward to doing such sessions uh, in future as well with you. And, and and look forward to having some of you guys or all of you guys as a part of uh, Tester Speak. Uh, you know, so the, the invitation is open to all of you. Thank you so much, Rajesh. Okay, so we have got some positive reviews already. All right. Okay, then. Okay, Bridgesh. Thank you. Thank you all for participating and sparing your time with us. Thank you so much. Okay, bye. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. Yes, bye. Bye-bye.